Good evening and welcome. So nice you could come out tonight, especially on such a cold night. Did you see the sun dog this morning? Fantastic. Welcome to Visionary Conversations. And I should tell you at the very beginning, I am not Dr. David Barnard. <laughs> I am Terry McLeod, a mere civilian. And I am the host of the weekend morning show at CBC Radio in Winnipeg. And my director would never forgive me unless I said 990 on your AM radio dial, <laughs> 89.3 on your FM dial, and I will be your moderator for this evening. Filling in, I'm thrilled to say, for President Barnard as he's unable to be here tonight. We're in Treaty 1 territory and on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. The University and the forks of the city of Winnipeg sit at the crossroads of the Anishinaabe, Métis, Cree, Dakota, and Oji Cree nations. Our topic tonight is a culture of conflict. What have we learned about war? This year marks the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I. Over the last 100 years, we've seen a number of further wars and conflicts, some brief, others protracted. We have also seen the evolution in the methods of combat. Trench warfare has given away to the use of cyber terrorism, drones, sanctions. International organizations such as the United Nations Security Council are also struggling to maintain relevance and power on the world stage. Given the evolution of warfare, are we moving further away from world peace? Uh, in our format for tonight, each panelist will have five minutes to present. Now that's a very compact period of time, but we'll have a lot more time following their presentations to explore some of their ideas. And after each of the panelists has spoken, we'll open the floor to your comments and questions. And wireless microphones will be circulating throughout the room in the hands of uh, Denise and Chris, who are sitting up at the back of the hall. Please be courteous to them. Uh, they'll identify who speaks next, and they'll hold the microphone for you as you ask your question. Uh, we want to include as many audience members as possible, so we ask that you are brief in your questions and comments. And you can follow our conversation on Twitter. The hashtag is hashtag UMVisionary. That's hashtag UMVisionary. This year, we're also introducing a new way to engage, and I'll explain how that works a little later. As always, we will conclude the discussion just before 8.30. I'll now introduce our first speaker from our panel, and our first speaker is Dr. Adam Muller. Dr. Muller is an associate professor in the Department of English, Film, and Theatre at the University of Manitoba and a research associate with the U of M Center for Professional and Applied Ethics, Center for Defense and Security Studies, and the Morrow Center for Peace and Justice Studies. Dr. Muller obtained his PhD from McGill University and his Master of Arts degree from the University of Alberta. He's a literary and cultural theorist, especially interested in the representation of mass violence and atrocity, both in works of art and in such public spaces as the modern museum. In addition to authoring articles on a diverse range of topics in literature, history, and philosophy, Dr. Muller is editor of Concepts of Culture, Art, Politics, and Society, and the co-editor of Fighting Words and Images Representing War Across the Disciplines, and the forthcoming, much anticipated book, The Idea of Human Rights, and of a Human Rights Museum, focusing on our own Canadian Museum of Human Rights. So please join me now in welcoming Dr. Adam Muller. Thank you very much, Terry. I appreciate the introduction. Thanks to all of you for uh, braving the weather to, to come. Um, when I started thinking about the question of what we've learned about war, I 
sort of decided to recast it a little bit as how we go about learning about war and changes in the way that we go about learning about um, military conflict, um, uh, genocide, atrocities, and so forth. And I decided for tonight that I would take as my point of departure uh, Susan Sontag's claim in regarding the pain of others that the understanding of war among people who have not experienced war is now chiefly a product of the impact of images. In other words, um, for Sontag, and I think I, I would agree with this, um, that uh, the visual has displaced uh, uh, the oral uh, and the narrative in terms of securing for us as uh, people perhaps with no direct experience of war, um, securing for us an understanding of what the term war actually means. The, the images have over the last 150 years or so increasingly occupied a kind of prominent place when it comes to making sense of war, what it is as an experience and, and, and as an undertaking. Now, at, it, at their best, I think images allow us to connect with um, uh, other people in an intimate and emotional way with other people's experiences of war. And this allows, uh, in, in the best case, I think, it allows for uh, a kind of humanization of the photographic subject, um, sometimes in unexpected ways. Um, by humanization here, I simply mean that I think the photographs uh, in particular, other forms of, of visual representation, um, help us to see uh, the subjects of war, both the victims and the antagonists, as human beings. Um, their human emphasizes aspects of the humanity at best, right, in the, on the best case. And I, I think I can make this point, or I'm going to try and make this point with reference to some images of soldiers, right? And I'm sure you all have ideas of who soldiers are, what they do, and so forth. Um, but I myself was sort of staggered by this series of photographs um, produced by the late Tim Hetherington, who died tragically covering a uh, photo, photojournalist, filmmaker, uh, made the amazing uh, war film Restrepo. Um, about American soldiers in Afghanistan, a Ford operating base in Afghanistan. Um, he made this amazing series of, uh, of, of photographs of, of soldiers sleeping. And um, what we see uh, here, of course, is a, uh, an American combat soldier um, curled up in the fetal position. And there's this odd tension that kind of arises out of an acknowledgement of the posture as a kind of fetal posture. Um, you don't see that much of the uniform. This is really a human being here who's asleep, who's in a sense defenseless, even as you see on his, uh, I don't know if, how clear it is in that image. It's quite clear, actually. You can see that he has tattooed on, on his, his belly the word combat. Right, so there's a, just an, a kind of just an interesting kind of resonance or juxtaposition, and actually, I think it's something about the, that that tension that represents what the photographic theorist um, or the theory, the cultural theorist Roland Barthes, in his work uh, *Camera Lucida*, his study of, of photography, called the punctum. For Bard, there was something in any photograph, and it would be different for each and every one of you, but there was something in every photograph that extended out of the photograph and entered into you. It actually punctured you in some way and became part of you. And it was the part of the photograph that you responded to emotionally, that you felt, right? Because there's going to be elements of this that you won't feel at all, but the punctum is that which in the photograph, because of who you are, what you bring to the viewing experience, enters into you and makes the photograph not just meaningful, but resonant in some particular way. And for me, it's that tension between the, the tattoo and that posture, right? And the acknowledgement that this is a human being. But I think there's other ways that these photographs can be humanizing, or photographs can be humanizing in the sense that I, I kind of mean it. And it's been a delight of mine to discover the photographs made or commissioned by the, the, the French uh, banker Albert Kahn, which um, were part of a project of his to archive, or to, uh, uh, to produce an archive of essentially everything, a photographic record of essentially ev everything. He produced an archive of, of more than 72,000 images and uh, uh, all, all color images from all over the world and um, also some early uh, films of architectural sites, sites of historical significance. And what we have here, of course, is a World War I soldier, not only in color, and if you think about World War I, of course, it's something like the Holocaust that you probably, like me, imagine for the most part in black and white, you know? Because those are the kinds of images, when we get images of the conflict, that we, 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 we see most often. But the Khan photographs are extraordinary because they're color photographs. And what we see here is a, a, a soldier at rest. In 1916, presumably springtime, late springtime maybe, early, uh, early summer maybe, so sometime essentially between Verdun in February and the Somme in July, 
right? So a time when the destruction of the war was sort of well known, especially by the French, you know, who'd borne the brunt of that early kind of combat. And what we see here is a, is a soldier at rest in color. And I think there's something strangely moving about this image. Maybe it's the flowers. I don't know. But it's, it's, it's going to vary for each of you. But there is a human being there, not just a, a sort of um, abject member of, a, of, of a, a trench resident mass, right? Which I think is typically how we see um, or imagine these soldiers. Now, of course, at worst, and I think this is the other side of the coin, and many commentators on, on the representation, of the photographic representation, the visual representation of war sort of emphasize, tend to emphasize this point, is that at worst, I think, images turn us into idle spectators, right? Uncaring consumers, right? Of other people's objectified pain and suffering. And it's not an accident that the early photographers of war um, in the 1850s, 1860s, and, and on produced images of war and its aftermaths for sale, right? They were actually literally producing commodities that would then be exchanged um, for money. And they turned the sufferers of war, the protagonists, antagonists of war, into, um, in, into objects for other people's consumption, OK? Um, and with that in view, I would sort of show an image like this, which is an image of an execution uh, that's about to take place in Syria, or that did take place in Syria last year, right? And uh, I mean, there, there are many such that we could, we, I could show you and talk about. This one actually was remarkably free from some of the gore that sort of characterizes, tend to characterize these images. But the question I have about images such as this is like, how should we approach them? How should we look at them in a way that does justice both to the victims and to the horror of the events that we're being invited to watch, right? Um, for me, incidentally, the punctum in this image are these bloody hands. Not the knife, not the look of fear. It might be different for you. As I say, the punctum is a very subjective thing. But the punctum for me are those bloody hands. Why? Because they show me that this is not the first such action of the day, right? That this is part of something bigger than this. Okay, and it encourages me to think beyond the frame of a photograph that actually has been produced for propagandistic purposes, right? And I'll return to that kind of issue in a, in, in a moment. But I want to do so via a kind of claim, returning to Sontag for a moment, a claim I'm intending, uh, I, I actually, intending as a kind of provocation for all of you who looked away, maybe, from that image, or were unmoved in some way by that image, or maybe too easily moved by that image in an unreflexive, or in a, sorry, in an unreflective, reflexive kind of way. What Sontag says is that there's a shame as well as shock in looking at the close-up of a real horror. Perhaps the only people with the right to look at images of suffering of this extreme order are those who could do something to alleviate it. And since this happened last year, and since we are over here, it's not clear to me that we are those people, right? Um, or to those who could learn from it. And then the question becomes, of course, how do you learn from it? What does it mean to learn from it? The rest of us, those people who aren't playing the learning game then, are voyeurs, whether or not we mean to be. In each instance, the gruesome invites us to be either spectators or cowards unable to look. Because I think the refusal to look is, of course, to refuse to acknowledge the last moments of this human being who's about to have his life taken away from him and the miserable conditions under which that life was taken. Okay? So I'll sort of conclude with this point, which is that no matter which image we're, uh, we're talking about, a camera's perspective, but you have to remember a camera is not an objective medium of representation. Like all such representations, it's a representation of the world. And as such, it represents someone else's view of things. And this view can be partial, it can be skewed in a particular direction, and if sometimes that view is going to be morally offensive. And then there are questions that arise naturally from this, I think, which include how then do we, as secondary witnesses to these events, make sense of them? How do we sort of contend with the partiality or the moral objectionability of these, of, of these images? Okay? And <clears throat> here is a perfectly objective image, right? Like this is a Civil War photograph, a relatively famous one, by a very famous Civil War photographer, Alexander Gardner. Um, which d documents this moment. And, and what tells you, what cues you into its objectivity in a way is the um, sort of the relaxed pose of this 
this Union soldier. Because if you think about the conventions of 19th century photography, you know, off, uh, the people who were photographed in the 19th century tended to be stiff and guarded, and you could see that rigidity in their bodies, and he's perfectly relaxed. This looks like photojournalism, right? But at the same time, what are we seeing? What we're seeing is a live Union soldier, a buried Union soldier, and a dead Confederate soldier. Why? Because you could show the enemy dead, but you couldn't show your own dead. This is an image that represents a certain kind of triumph. And that convention, by the way, and certainly in the American context, obtained until 1943, the first time it was permitted to show American combat dead. And I mean, obviously, the Confederate soldier is an American, but he wasn't the right kind of American. He was the enemy, OK? But um, the first time it was permitted to show the, the um, American combat dead was 1943 the Battle of Buna in, the, in, in, in New Guinea. Um, similarly, this is an image from a phot photography exhibition I curated this summer of, of Soviet-era Trotsky photographs. This is an image confiscated from a perpetrator, from another Nazi, who took the photograph of a friend, a colleague, a workmate, executing somebody on the ground. And everything about this photograph implicates you in the perspective of a kind of uh, Nazi triumphalist. Think about the dominance of the photographic position. It's elevated perspective over the body, right? This is a, the, 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 there's a, a kind of um, subordination, like a compounded subordination here, loomed over by um, the executioner, who is in turn loomed over by uh, a, a, a fellow Nazi soldier. And of course, what we're being invited to do by the photographer here is accept that position of superiority. Right? So how, how do you not do that given the framing of the image? And then kind of lastly, and again this is intended as a kind of provocation, I, d I debated actually giving it a caption at all and seeing what you made of it. But this is an image taken of concentration camp guards including Carl Hucker, who was the, um, Hucker, who was the um, deputy commandant of, of, of Auschwitz in its final, in its final years. Um, a photograph of him um, and friends, including some members of the Women Auxiliary, and they're all concentration camp guards. And they, this picture was taken as part of a series of photographs that was taken at a resort for these guards. It was located about 20 kilometers away from Auschwitz, where they were given some downtime. And what you see is the rain starting to fall just as the photograph was taken, and everybody laughing because they're starting to get wet. And it's part of a series where you can actually see the rain coming in. They're about to cross a little bridge, and they're having a really good time, right? But to see, like, so I, I kind of want to know at some level what, how you look at this image. Because at, at, formally, it's an image of people having a really good time. I mean, you could sort of notice the SS insignia and so forth, and that's, that's worth noting, but you know, um, nevertheless, if you want to import all that stuff about Auschwitz, you have to look outside of the frame of the photograph to give the image that resonance, right? So, like, is that legitimate to do? Do you distort the photograph by bringing in that other information, right? How do we look at images of this kind? So, thank you very much. Fascinating work, Dr. Muller. Thank you so much. Really illuminating. I'd like now to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Andrea Charon. And Dr. Charon is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Studies in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Manitoba. She holds a PhD from Royal Military College of Canada, a Master of International Relations from Webster University in the Netherlands, and a Master of Public Administration from Dalhousie University. Dr. Charon was a participant of Canada's management trainee program and worked for various federal departments, including Canada's Revenue Agency, Canada's Border Services Agency, and the Privy Council in the Security and Intelligence Secretariat. She completed her postdoctoral work at Carleton's Norman Patterson School of International Affairs and is now Deputy Director of the Center for Defense and Security Studies at the University of Manitoba. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrea Charon. Thank you very much. As uh, Terry mentioned, it's, it's really important, I think, that we're talking about war in 2014, because as he mentioned, it marks the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I the 75th of the start of World War II, and the 25th of the end of the Cold War. 
And as we reflect on these wars, we note that they were all wars involving states. And I want to suggest to you that states are instrumental to our understanding of armed conflict. For many years, we have been convinced that states, although often instigators of war, are essential for controlling, limiting, and even ending war. The idea of the state, though, which is our ordering principle today, is really fairly new. It wasn't until 1648 and the adoption of a series of treaties known as the Peace of Westphalia that ended the Thirty Years' War that we actually had this thing called a state. And the great powers of the day, former family dynasties and empires, decided that peace could be achieved if states reigned supreme and this idea of sovereignty was respected. And that worked beautifully until Napoleon and he had grand designs on Europe and the rest of the world. Nevertheless, this idea of the state and its legitimate monopoly on the use of force held. Indeed, the great powers, the great European powers like Austria, Russia, Prussia and Britain formed what we call the Concert of Europe. It was a system of conferences and diplomacy to ensure that one, the likes of Napoleon didn't catch them off guard again and that great powers didn't go to war. As backup, laws limiting the lethality of war, the Hague Laws, were also adopted, and war was becoming civilized. And then we had World War I, in which 65 million soldiers were mobilized, 8.5 million killed, 21 million wounded, and 7 million taken as prisoner. And this doesn't even begin to count the civilians. To ensure this didn't happen again, the states formed the flawed Wilsonian League of Nations. But before the ink had dried on this, this Treaty of Ver Versailles, the seeds of World War II had been sown. But states again had the answer. What we need are more laws of war, and hence the Geneva Conventions were created. And the first truly international and universal organization called the UN was formed and it banned the use of force between states, except for a few special states, the so-called Permanent Five, who were given special powers in the form of a veto. And it was up to them and the Security Council to decide how best to solve all future conflicts. This power, of course, was immediately undermined by two states in particular <coughs> during the Cold War. Now, if we fast forward to today, war seems very different. Many more wars happen within a state rather than between states. And so-called non-state actors, and we sometimes call them rebels, opposition forces, freedom fighters, and terrorists, are as likely to be the combatants of war as our state militaries. Many of these non-state actors are trying to dismantle the ordering principle that favors the state, and more importantly, the right to govern. And so they are said to be fighting corruption, they fight for resources, they fight the government, they fight for, for and against ideology, and they fight each other. The difference today, though, is that the main target, regardless of the type of war, are civilians. But still, this thing called the state remains the most important actor. And this is underlined most by a group called the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, or ISIL and its attempt to become a state, and in its estimation, benefit from the legitimacy of statehood, of course, minus any of the responsibilities towards its would-be citizens. And then running parallel to all of these wars is the idea that war can still be stopped, that people can be saved. The trick is to choose the right states and the right organizations to intervene. But do these intervention efforts help end war, or are they making things worse? In the words of US military strategist Edward Lutvak, should we be giving war a chance? He asks, do imposed ceasefires and UN or other coalition missions give belligerents time to rearm and reconstitute their forces? Is bombing at 15,000 feet the best way to protect civilians? And are refugee camps a boon for those who want to round up civilians they attract, 
as well as benefit from the food and protection these camps are trying to provide. In other words, Lutwak is suggesting that a bad or a half-hearted effort to attempt to end war is far worse than the stability that come from a war of attrition and exhaustion, because it's only then that you get, in his estimation, a clear winner and a clear loser. But of course, humanity's impulse still compels states to act, and this is the topic of Adam's talk. Perhaps then, rather than doing nothing, what we need to do is give more thought to the unintended consequences when we try and instill these good intentions and the role that we are asking our military and our police to take in these theaters of war. So long as the ordering principle of our world remains centered on the state, they remain paramount and history repeats itself. It's perhaps ironic then that at wreaths often used in remembrance ceremonies have as their origin the crowns of kings, Etruscan kings, who set about assigning the world order principle for ancient Europe. Thank you. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, my indiscreet power pack <clears throat> fell out of my pocket. Anyway, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chateron. And uh, our final speaker for this evening of our panelists is Dr. Regine King. Dr. King is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Manitoba. She obtained her PhD at Factor Inwintosh Faculty of Social Work at the University of Toronto, named, as she was telling me, for two of the major benefactors to that school of social work. And her Master of Education in Counseling Psychology and Community Development at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. Her research interests include social processes in post-genocide Rwanda, women's rights and psychosocial well-being of survivors of organized violence. Dr. King is also interested in cross-cultural mental health interventions. She has published on the Gachacha Truth Commission uh, grassroots intergroup dialogue and other healing processes in post-genocide Rwanda along with transnational research and north-south partnerships in social work education. As a survivor of the Tutsi genocide in Rwanda, she is committed to social justice, human rights, and healthy communities. Dr. King focuses on genocide education and prevention through public speaking both in academic and non-academic settings. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Regine King. Good evening. You are still here, yes? <laughs> <laughs> Talking about war is not that fun. Uh, the topic is quite timely. Uh, given what's going on around the world. Have we learned anything about war? Do we favor a culture of conflict or a culture of peace? Tonight, I will emphasize the importance of working with local actors and civil society in order to build lasting peace. These people don't carry arms and are never invited to the negotiating tables. Violence is very real. I survived the Tutsi genocide in Rwanda. I witnessed the world falling apart around me. And I learned that actually, before the genocide ended, international NGOs had already started doing relief work in some parts of the country while the killings were still going on in my area. So the world has many good doers, people who are willing to carry out crisis interventions, uh, including, the uh, including the victims of war. But how come that they don't invest in preventing violence or stop it when it's happening? 
So Terry, when we met last week, he asked to me whether I consider uh, the peace building before violence occurs. I told him that based on my experience, I never heard of peace building before the genocide started. I knew that people's rights uh, were being violated. Uh, people who tried to speak up were tortured, forced into exile, if they were lucky enough to be alive. Many Rwandans uh, didn't have many choices or knew otherwise. So an example was the use of ethnic identity cards that allowed or denied access uh, based on one's ethnicity. Ethnic quotas were imposed on youth and young children uh, wishing to have access to higher education. This discriminatory policy was uh, justified by the Rwandan government as a way of balancing uh, the number of intellectuals between the ethnic groups. <coughs> Foreign diplomats, teachers, members of UNESCO, and the researchers who visited and spent actually enough time in Rwanda to understand what was going on uh, knew all about this. But it was a great violation of human rights. But they didn't challenge it. Actually, they supported the programs that the government was implementing that were very much based on those discriminatory practices. So if we cannot prevent violence from happening or stop it once it has started, how come that we fail to build peace? I mean, lasting peace by which the famous never, get, never again uh, can have its real meaning. So I think people at different levels uh, fail in the process of building peace, especially when we are trying to intervene in those non-Western and low-income countries. We face this challenge as academicians, policymakers, and the practitioners, because we think we know what is the best for people who engage in violence. We impose the theories. Many of them have been developed based on the assessments uh, done in the relatively peaceful Western nations. We hand these theories to practitioners and the policymakers who take them to places where they have never been assessed. Our international communities, community and donors whose money we use uh, put up conditions and the mandates and the time limits. We provide these donors with very positive reports that are short based. We develop good feelings about ourselves, about the work done. But all we are doing is really building on the sand. The kind of peace we are talking about it's, is a very, very fragile peace, which doesn't last. According to Paul Correa from Oxford University, over 50% of the countries that have suffered severe violence uh, in the recent past will relapse again into violence within five years. The statistic is quite sobering. So why are we failing in our peace building efforts? One answer I can provide uh, for now, is that we have very good intentions, but we use methods of exporting uh, building approaches uh, that tend to overlook the issues uh, and local issues and fail to include assessments of local resources and the possible and affordable solutions to violence. 
we tend to ignore local actors. I have a few examples uh, that uh, from Rwanda where I continue to do my research. Many of these local actors, they have the same intentions as us. They are also searching solutions to stop violence that concern them directly. They are actually more concerned than us because we are talking about their peace. But their efforts tend to be undermined uh, by not only external actors, but also local governments that, that depend on external money for running their government. This is not to, to say that the countries out of war don't need external support. Some concepts and methods and resources must actually come from the West. We are developed countries. However, I concur with the statement given at the 2012 conference, which uh, was held at the Kroc Institute, uh, University of Notre Dame in the US, uh, on global governance and the future of strategic peace building. The statement goes like this. Strategic peace building begins uh, with eliciting local knowledge, diagnosing the causes of violence, and building partnerships on the ground in the actual setting of the deadly conflict. Without starting there, peace building approaches will, not, will continue to fail. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. King, and thank you, Dr. Muller and Dr. Seron, for your opening remarks. Uh, we'll now begin the uh, question and answer portion of the evening again. Before our first question, I'd like to mention the uh, new engagement tool that we're using this year as part of the Visionary Conversations called Conferences I.O. This new tool will allow participants to engage in tonight's discussion in a new way. You can submit questions for the panelists and rank questions that uh, fellow audience members have posted. We'll be pulling questions from here throughout the night and our aim is to make sure that we're addressing the questions that are top of mind for you. Instructions were placed on the tables prior to the event and I presume you have those, yes? Mm, good, okay. And uh, we have something up on the screen as well. So follow uh, the web address where you will be prompted to enter the online discussion, and we welcome your feedback and participation throughout tonight's discussion. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, is there a question from the floor now that you'd like to offer up via the microphone. And there's a question down here at the front. Hi, I have a question for Dr. Miller. Um, it's about the modern warfare, because um, modern warfare is mostly with drones, and you know, it's, it's out, of, out of sight, you know. Is that out of mind? And is it ethical for a soldier who doesn't know who he is killing, and possibly if he is killing civilians, if he knows he is civ killing civilians, you know, in most of the drone strikes, we know that you know most of the most of the casualties are civilians. Is it ethical for a person knowing that he would be killing some innocent people to commit that act on orders from whoever? Well, I mean, as far as the ethical, like the strictly ethical question goes, then I think um, you, you don't have a just war to the extent that you're targeting non-combatants and deliberately targeting non-combatants. So, like, no, it's not ethical to do that. But what I find interesting about modern warfare, drone warfare, and actually targeting technologies generally, um, and it's worth at this point just sort of acknowledging and passing the very close connection between optical technologies and military technologies because um, through uh, aerial reconnaissance initially, lenses were improved, cameras were made lighter, eventually these worked their way into the civilian market. We constantly have this kind of interplay between uh, the military sphere and the public sphere more generally in terms of these kinds of visual technologies. But what we see happening with the representation 
of death that uh, we're given as a general public by the military to justify its action and explain its successes is a kind of derealization of, um, of actual de destruction. By which I mean, if you look at these images, what you see are fuzzy forms, often night vision, um, green, and, um, and, and, and a kind of detached remoteness that is conveyed uh, through the, the, the kind of perspective you're given on, on the strike, on the particular strike in question. And I think on the one hand, this convinces the general public that there's something almost sanitary about this destruction, and it makes it easier for us as a whole to sort of authorize and legitimate um, the governments that, 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 that put their militaries to this kind of use. Um, at the same time, of course, what we see are gaming technologies that make uh, the simulation of warfare appear even more real. So actual warfare is becoming uh, like more, like more derealized at the same time that simulated warfare is becoming more apparently real. And I think we as a public are kind of losing track of the difference. And that makes it again, <laughs> as disorienting, and again, it makes it a little bit easier for us to sign on to killing projects that maybe we need to have much more inf real, useful information about. Dr. Sharon, I'd be curious to hear yeah. you, your response to this. I was, I was wondering if, uh, <coughs> since it's not really declared war, mm -hmm. it's war, but it's not war, it's something else. What, mm -hmm. uh, what, what would you like to say in response to the question? Well, we have uh, international laws that have always tried to limit the impact of war. And you know, there are three bodies of it. There are laws about when you can go to war, laws about what you do when you're in war, and then there are laws about what you try and do to keep the peace after the war. And when you're referring to a drone and it kills civilians, um, there is the Geneva Conventions, and they're based on three theories or, or, or three principles. So the first is proportionality. So if uh, a combatant has a knife, this is not grounds for you to drop a nuclear missile on them. That's not proportional. Uh, the other one is distinction, and that's probably the most important that you have to distinguish between combatants who look like they're soldiers and civilians and also wounded soldiers or anybody who's what we call hors de combat. You're not supposed to target them. And it doesn't matter if you're uh, a soldier with a rifle and you can see the individual, or you're a soldier and you're somewhere in Washington or wherever and you're using a drone. Uh, that's still not, not acceptable. And the final one is necessity. Um, is there a militarily necessary target? Which means that in some cases, yes, <coughs> civilians uh, are killed because the military necessity is is great enough that it's warranted, but uh, this, is, this is why you have lawyers that are deployed, military lawyers deployed with troops now to make soldiers think about those distinctions. Um, and to Terry's question, the Geneva Conventions now are, 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 are so well known, or at least they should be well known, you can't get away with saying, well, I'm not really a soldier because I'm not in a uniform, or um, I, I don't speak, I don't report to a minister of national defense, et cetera, et cetera. I've never been taught these rules. This is why we have the International Committee of the Red Cross. And they're thinking of is when you pick up a gun, then you're starting to count as a combatant, and therefore all of those rules and regulations about the use of force are going to apply to you. Sorry. Um, so are our programs, our drone programs, in violation to Geneva program or Geneva Convention? Well, that's why they, they're very careful about who and what they're targeting, and it's gone through a vetted list. And yes, this doesn't mean that, they're, 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 that civilians aren't killed, um, and, and that's tragic, but they're always trying to, to limit it. Now, some groups don't. Some, their whole point is to target civilians. Uh, and clearly they're just ignoring completely any of these laws of, of the Geneva Conventions. Uh, well, we, if, if you wouldn't mind, we have another question at the back, and I'll come back to you if we have the time. And so we're going to go here to Denise. Hi, this is just an observation, and I'm wondering if somebody could comment. Um, since the Second World War, most of the conflicts, or a lot of the conflicts, are between cultural religious groups where um, they seem to, upon the resolution of such thing of the conflict, they retreat into 
their own geographic area. I'm using Sudan, for example, right now, and there's others. And, and that's the way wars seem to be going, where we're, we're getting more homogeneous states formed following the conflict, which is, to me, diametrically opposed to the Western democracies that have oh, uh, many different cultural groups within the geographic area that somehow get along. And, and, I, and I'm seeing this, this great divide happening between the Western democracies and essentially the rest of the world. Uh, am I seeing things right? Whomever would like to address that? Regine? No? I, I can give it a crack and then Regine, you can jump in. But um, one of the, the, the problems, um, and I'm going to go back to World War I, is after World War I, the first thing that happened was they spread out maps around the world and they said to the map makers, okay, take the territory, go redraw these maps. So, you know, and they literally <laughs> kind of went, uh, okay, that looks good. And they didn't take into consideration things like, history, kinship, where do they go to market, what do, does this river cut them off from markets and things like that. Um, and so many of the wars we see now are still tracing back to those bad decisions about uh, uh, borders that were done sort of willy-nilly in the past. Um, but I, I, think, I think you do have an a, astute observation there that it does seem in many ways that war is changing. Um, but that's, yeah, I have to still think about that. Anyone else? Well, the nature of war is changing, but it doesn't spare the involvement of the Western democracies. Uh, I mean, like, uh, uh, the example I know is Rwanda, and uh, so many nations were very much implicated in what happened in Rwanda. It was uh, the French uh, government that trained the military in Rwanda. Uh, to kill their own people. Uh, the UN was very present when the genocide started. Uh, even though they were there to keep the peace, they actually left when things w went ugly. So maybe it's not happening on the territory of the Western nations, but the Western nations are very much involved into the wars that are taking place beyond. Would you say that Rwanda is now a more homogeneous nation? Uh, what, 900,000 people died in that genocide, right? Uh, it, more than a million people died mm. in the Rwandan genocide. And they were uh, mostly Tutsis, yes? Uh, and moderate Hutus. So it changed the, the nature of the country in that way? Did it change the nature of the country? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, in the way that uh, it, at the end of the day, it was Rwandans killing other Rwandans. So that, for the first time, it took on a national uh, approach, which was very new. But at the same time, uh, the genocide in Rwanda has sparked other wars that now we are observing in the Congo. Uh, yeah, so it started there, but now it's uh, regional. Uh, okay. Dr. Sean? I had another thought. Um, I think w one of the things that, that democracies, and I'm talking about robust democracies, do do is they keep in mind the rights of majorities and minority populations, which you don't see um, all the time. Uh, we're seeing a lot of sort of illiberal democracies where they've had an election, but they actually don't have the institutions, the culture, the history of protecting rights. And you think of our motto here in Canada, which is peace, order, and good government. And then ISIL, which is saying their motto is remaining and expanding. Well, that's a very different ap approach and philosophy on life uh, right there. So I, I think that's one. And that's where Canada, um, who was instrumental in putting together this responsibility to protect doctrine, what it tried to do was take those human rights that we think are so important. We now see that when they are violated, systematically violated, when they are abused, when they are ignored, um, that is leading to war, ethnic genocide, et cetera, et cetera. 
So we need as an international community to react to that before it becomes ethnic genocide and look at these abuses of human rights as a big red warning flag and reacting, the first responsibility is to react sooner and not wait until you have so many people killed. Mm -hmm. Just a small point, um, I would urge us not to be overly complacent about the comforts and privileges of the West in the wake of the deployment of more than 2,000 troops in Missouri yesterday to deal with the aftermaths of, uh, I think, a gross miscarriage of justice that reflects a broader pattern of structural injustices um, that manifest themselves perhaps not so much in outright warfare as in um, the imprisonment of racial minorities in disproportionate numbers and so on and so forth. So I would just say, like, I don't think the West is all that. Another question? Yeah, just to uh, kind of get, I, the, the conversation was, is war as we presently know it, is it, is it actually, is there any vision of peace beyond that? And I, I guess I would put this as a question and a comment, whoever wants to answer it. Um, because my own experience, uh, I'm a veteran of the Cold War in the Royal Canadian Navy, and, and more involved in that was the Cuban Missile Crisis, of which I was involved in. And we knew very well who our, our enemy was. There was no question about that. And I, I sense since then in these conflicts, and that doesn't make them lesser of a conflict, it just means it's di more difficult to deal with, I think, is that often you don't know who the enemy is or you don't know who your oppressor is or, or you have some idea who they are. And, and particularly in, in the sense of, uh, Adam, you were talking about in your pictures and, and, and certainly the comments about drones and that. I mean, that sanitizes the whole thing to a point where we, uh, you know, it just becomes like a game almost. And, and so I, I'm interested in your comment on that because uh, I, I very well knew who my enemy was when I was in the military. Any response? Uh, we have another question here in the front, right here. It uh, appears to me that um, the panelists were talking about modern wars uh, mostly targeting civilians uh, by the state to maintain their power. Uh, then it becomes uh, a genocide when, uh, you know, when civilians are targeted. My question is about um, ongoing genocide, things, you know, genocide that is going on. What does it take for the world to recognize that a genocide is going on? Uh, the context that I'm talking about is uh, in China, that if I use the analogy of war, we see the top leader of the Chinese Communist Party declared a war against a group of peaceful meditation called the Falun Gong in the 1990s who has no weapons and they have no resources, um, but the, t the Communist Party want to maintain their power when this meditation group grew to the extent that outnumber the Communist Party. So now there are so much evidences, no matter from the lawyer, from medical professionals, that during the mass detention, these practitioners, that when they are tissue matched, they would be forced on the operation table and be taken one organ out and then another organ from their bodies until they died. And when they were taking them out, they were still alive. So this is a genocide because according to the United Nations Article 2 of the Convention on Genocide, is civilians who practice a religion or a spirituality is being targeted. So, uh, like what Andrea was saying, uh, how can we react sooner? Like, there's, a, there's an author, uh, Ethan Gutman has just published a book that uh, 65,000 uh, Falun Gong practitioners, plus some Uyghurs and Tibetans, were already died on those operation tables. So how many more do we want to see until the world recognize that this is a genocide and do something about it. So this is a ongoing genocide that I like to hear about that. Respond? 
Well, if I put my international relations hat on and I look at what is the organ, the only organ in the world that's <coughs> allowed to make international law and binding decisions about the use of force to, to maybe stop this, of course, is the UN Security Council. And those five special members um, who have the veto, and, and, and one is China. So it's, there's a blockage there. Now, before we, you know, toss out the UN Security Council and say it's, it's the worst thing ever. Um, it has managed to keep the P5 from going to war. And that was always the intent of the Security Council. And given that all five have nuclear weapons, uh, that's always been very important. But it does mean then that from the outside, it looks very selective in terms of what conflicts they choose to try and um, address because it has to be something that is either of national interest to one of the P5 that nobody else cares about or it has to be an issue that nobody cares about in which case they're very happy to try things but as soon as you have a conflict that involves the national interests of more than one of the P5s then that's when it's very difficult to make decisions. That being said, I think they have done some very inventive things. When we look at what they've done with sanctions, when we look at the fact that they set up the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in Rwanda, which is the reason why we were able to get an international criminal court, um, they can do some good things. But it, you know, it, it comes down to the P5 and their national interests and what can and cannot get on the agenda. And to the gentleman with the, the drones, um, I'm not so sure that they're not feeling the impact of those decisions. There are many US servicemen and women who are in that position that do suffer from PTSD. And the difference is they don't go with their unit. And they don't have people to talk to. And they don't have time to decompress. They go in the office. They work their drone. They get in the car. They go home to their kid's soccer team. Ugh. And, and it's very difficult to, to get your brain to switch on soldier, off soldier, uh, and, and one of the things we don't do is, is provide enough mental health uh, for soldiers, for police. Police are, are uh, Canadian police, uh, there are 54 Canadian police officers deployed in UN missions, um, the rest are soldiers and we only have 88 total, and the police make up the biggest chunk, so we need mental health for, for, for police, for firemen, for, you know, Everybody, <laughs> we all need mental health. I need mental health right, help right now talking about war. <laughs> now, uh, Janine is tracking some of the uh, comments on Conferences I.O. Uh, we, we have a question from Conferences I.O. Is World War III a possibility? Who wants to take that on? Yes, right? Uh, so long as it's the case that there isn't a kind of global consensus and a, and, and a political consensus, which seems increasingly elusive in this time of fragmentation and dissensus, then, um, then large-scale violence between uh, nuclear states is a possibility. Um, that's not to say that there are not a lot of safety valves and international mechanisms, as Andrea said, that are designed specifically to forestall this. But I think it's actually useful as a possibility because if we don't have the worst case, we might be slightly less inclined to pursue um, remediation and, and constructive solutions to some of the problems that bedevil us. So, you know, yes, it's a possibility and I think, I think we should keep it in view. And I would, uh, I would like to add that uh, uh, when you think of uh, <laughs> the first two world wars that happened, historically is to look at what happened before they actually occurred. So uh, are we experiencing any kinds of dehumanization of particular groups of people, dehumanization of entire nations, uh, particular groups that go across the state that is supposed to be the protector? Uh, yes, there is a possibility because we can yeah. see mm -hmm. structural violence mm -hmm. increasing rather than decreasing. Dr. King, could I ask you too, why did the genocide stop in Rwanda? 
<laughs> Very good question. Uh, how did it stop? It's not that the killings ended because uh, some of us were still in hiding. Uh, uh, the killers were going to go after those who have killed too many people so that they don't become a danger to their own families. But what was being missed in the process was that uh, the more people you kill, the more you were also going to become a member on the list that has to be eliminated. So how did it stop? It stopped by uh, uh, the Rwandan Patriotic Army, which was a guerrilla army at the time, which was fighting very hard to stop the killings and uh, save as many lives as they could. Uh, it wasn't the international community. It wasn't any Western power. If they did, it was very indirectly. But it was Rwandans who grew up in refugee camps, who knew how it was to be st stateless, with no citizenship of any country, uh, with not even like, an official refugee status that decided to intervene uh, asking first to return to Rwanda peacefully, and when the negotiations failed, uh, the former Rwandan army started killing inside the country. Uh, the RPF started from outside coming inside to stop uh, the genocide as much as they could. How much um, work did you do or have you done on the front line of peace building in Rwanda. I'm curious as to the kind of response that you get when you say to people, we need to build peace. What did they say? Uh, initially, I don't think people are interested in peace. <laughs> uh, they just want to go back to normal life. Uh, they want to be able to raise their children. They want to be able to go back to their farms and jobs. Uh, but in the process, you can do it uh, if uh, the next neighbor is the very person who hurted you, who hurt you deeply. So uh, in the context of Rwanda, people who started the uh, building of the peace building process were people who were very much concerned about how people can go back to normal life with all that they had witnessed. Did you have to suppress the urge for revenge? That has to be at the front uh, of your mind. Otherwise, revenge exists in everyone. Mm. Uh, if maybe I ask uh, Janine to go to the slide of uh, number two, please. Uh, it's uh, an example of a Rwandan scorer who was very much concerned about uh, how to go about a normal life back into the former communities uh, with when people were accusing each other, were blaming each other for the suffering they had experienced, uh, who actually started uh, this whole healing and uh, uh, peace building process. He's, he wasn't working for any NGO. He didn't have much money. But he was confronting Rwandans, telling them very clearly that if they want to build peace, they need to come together as Hutus and Tutsis. And that's what he, he did. So I became the, his first participant of his program, uh, got fascinated by it, uh, got to facilitate the same workshops between the Hutus and the Tutsis. I was hated by both because they all felt that I was bending on one side and then on the other. But it was through that confrontation that actually people can start talking uh, clearly about the issues that divide them. And it's the same kind of work I continue to investigate. Uh, every year I go back <laughs> and the work continues. But as we are no longer talking about it, the not no longer, but as we continue to talk about the peace, it's now going into a uh, grassroots level, looking at the issues of domestic violence, uh, which is increasing as ex-prisoners go back to their families. 
as the children grow up without knowing who killed their parents. So the structural violence I talked about earlier is not a myth. And if it's not addressed, it leads to further deterioration of community values. We have another question from over here. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to hear from one or other member of the um, panel uh, to provide some information about the World Court. And that is, um, I, would, I would like to know over the years how much good they have done, and I would like to hear some specific examples of what, they, what good they've done. And then the second uh, question is, what is their budget? You're talking about the International Criminal Court and not the International Court of Justice, because there are two, two international courts, and they can both deal with, with, one can deal specifically with individuals and crimes against humanity, the International Criminal Court, and then the International Court of Justice can deal with states and their conflicts. So they both uh, are, are, are integral to, to, to stopping wars. Well, well, that doesn't answer my question. Could I, could I still find out what their budgets are and what good they do? Okay, well, so that I, I, what, you, what you have to do, one, the International Court of Justice is uh, an organ of the UN. So if you go onto the UN website, you'll find out their budget. I, I, I don't know off the top of my head. The International Criminal Court is not connected to the UN. It's based in The Hague. Um, you have to be, states have to sign on to the Rome Statute to be a member of the International Criminal Court. And there is a fabulous uh, documentary on the International Criminal Court and specifically the first prosecutor, Del Campo, that was done by Canada part of the National Film Board, and it outlines the, the problems the International Criminal Court had to get up and running. It's not been a great record, uh, but it was, only, it, it, it was only started up in the 2000s, and it can only try cases back to 2002. So we're, we're fairly early days in terms of the International Criminal Court. But the, the budget's in the millions, but I can't tell you exa the exact number. You would have to go onto the International Criminal Court website, and they have that information. Well, yes, they, they have reinforced the fact that rape is now a weapon of war. And they're, setting, they're starting to set precedents. And they are, you know, a lot of states, not all, but some states, you know, they do keep in the back of their mind that this is a possibility. Uh, I would add that uh, it's, uh, I don't have the numbers on the top of my head, but um, billions of dollars are spent uh, in those courts. Uh, the one I know most will be ICTR, uh, which tried genocidaire, uh, the top genocidaire who uh, uh, planned and uh, kind coordinated the genocide in Rwanda uh, for, I think, in a period of eight years, they only tried 26 cases, even though they acknowledged rape as a weapon of war. Uh, many of them who confessed to have actually participated in acts of rape and then he confessed other acts like uh, participating in the killings. Sometime uh, rape was overthrown. So, yeah, 26. I th the Rwandan government got tired of hearing about them, and that's when they went for the Gachacha Truth Commission, uh, actually reshaping its own initial mission. Um, asserting that uh, if people need to be in jail and be punished, uh, maybe the best way was to do community courts because there was no other way that uh, criminals were, of genocide were going to be tried. Who provides uh, the money to fund that court? The ICCC, the yeah. ICC, well both are member states. So uh, okay. it's member states yeah. that are assessed. An, Does an, Canada an contribute to it? Oh yes. In fact, Philip had uh, Philip. Philip Kirsch was the is Canadian. He was the first president of the International Criminal Court. So yes, Canada has a long connection with the International Criminal Court and was um, very much a part of drafting the Rome Statute. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have a question up here. Yes, go ahead. 
Oh, sorry. Um, uh, Dr. Sharon, you mentioned in your talk um, an American military, military leader uh, saying uh, half-hearted intervention is worse uh, than nothing. Uh, with regards to the rise of power of ISIL, um, is that a result of a half-hearted intervention in the Middle East? And uh, what level of intervention is appropriate for us to take now in ah, that conflict? A, uh, that, uh, whew, if we had that answer. No, that's a, that's a very, very good question. And, and many have said that you know, we, we, we created this, this monster because of flawed plans on intervention that then create um, dissatisfaction and they want to write that dissatisfaction. Um, so yeah, that's what military planners around the world are. How do we deal with this? Because on the one hand, ISIL, we, we definitely don't want uh, in Iraq, but in Syria, ISIL is an enemy of Assad, and we're not keen on Assad. So the enemy we don't want in Iraq is potentially sort of a help in Syria. So now how do you, how do you get, get this, act, this non-state actor here, but sort of stop them there, but also you want them to help with the Assad regime? It's, it's, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. And you've got so many more non-state actors and state actors, it's, it's really difficult. And whom we think is, help, is a help today, often we find out in the next reiteration, whoops, now we're fighting them. So it's, it, it, it really is a, a constant battle. I just wanted to add that I think it would be a mistake to assume that military intervention guarantees, like even successful military intervention, whatever that means, it's going to guarantee peace. And um, I'm mindful of the German military strategist Clausewitz in the 19th century. He said you can do anything with bayonets except sit on them, meaning obviously you, know, you can get stuff done, but that's not the same thing as, 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 as making peace, securing peace. And I think Regine's been saying this as, as well. Peace, building peacemaking is a, is a different set of processes, and we have to look elsewhere for that. Uh, Chris, do you have another question there? Andrea, um, you mentioned the fact that statehood is no longer a requirement for political violence, and just acknowledging the similar effects of both types of violence, conventional warfare and terrorism has on non-combatants and the ability to possibly justify, justify or um, satisfy just war tradition, do you think we should approach non-state non violence with a less condemn, condemning view, like this predisposition of immorality? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So, so be, are you asking if, if things like um, if conventional warfare can be justified based on principles? Well, what what is what is conventional warfare? So like you need two, modern two, state two, two state militaries, warfare. two states going at it. Yeah. yeah. What's stopping non-state warfare from satisfying just tradition or just war tradition? Well, it still can. I mean, the, 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 the just war principles still apply even if you aren't, um, you know, the traditional uh, uniform soldier sponsored by a state. It's still, it still applies. Um, the problem is when you have the non-state actors that refuse to accept that they are supposed to be abiding by these laws as well. And so the International Committee of the Red Cross um, is, is working tirelessly to, to meet both state combatants and non-state combatants to remind everybody of their responsibility. Um, the difference between our professional soldiers is this is part of their training. Every Canadian soldier has, has to learn about the laws of warfare and what are their ROEs or rules of engagement and what are the penalties for not following those rules of engagement. Um, I, I'm, I, that's not the case in, in a group like ISIL. And in fact, their whole modus operandi is to make sure that they don't follow them and uh, create panic and terror amongst the widest group of people possible. And that is, that is the difference between professional military soldiers and these non-state actors. Question over here. Um, <clears throat> this is a provocative question, maybe a commentary as well. So I warn you. <clears throat> uh, so far, uh, the discussion has been, uh, as I see it, one-sided. Uh, we discussed uh, civil wars in developing countries. 
we fail to notice that actually global, global politics is not really designed and created by developing countries, but actually by the developed countries firsthand. Uh, the greatest military power in, in the world um, he has been involved in military interventions since it was founded, okay? Uh, starting with uh, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, uh, moving to Iraq, one, two, three. Uh, Middle East currently is thermal oil. Why? Is it only the result of civil wars inside or it was also instigated from uh, the outside? Um, it looks to me that many of these international institutions are actually designed to educate, teach, guide uh, developing nations, but we fail to see actually our own responsibility, we who live in so-called Western democracies. Even if you look inside Canada here, we, we, we try to judge genocide outside, around the world, and we fail to see what has happened with the Aboriginal people over here. Uh, Museum of Human Rights doesn't feature Aboriginals actually as a, a victim of, of genocide, but does feature five uh, cases over there. So my question is the following uh, to you, if you may deal with this. Would there only be uh, any moment in the future where those individuals, groups, in the most developed Western world uh, countries, uh, United States in, uh, in particular, would be brought to any sort of justice? for uh, going into war and, and killing hundreds of millions of people? That's my question. So I've recently actually written on the question of indigenous genocide and I'm actually on record as having faulted the CMHR for refusing to use settler colonial genocide as uh, the term to designate um, the experience of indigenous people of European settlement in this, in this particular country and then the institutions such as the residential school system that were created in the wake of that settlement to reconfigure indigenous life, uh, modes of life. Um, so I, th I think it's genocide and I, th I have arguments uh, why I think it's genocide and at least part of the public's resistance to accepting it as genocide is that they're sort of trapped within a way of thinking legally about genocide that's overly indebted to the definition as it's featured in the, or as it's present and, and constructed in the Genocide Convention. And we forget to historicize that convention and look at, look at its kind of post-war history, the attempts by Lemkin to include um, uh, more, uh, cultural, uh, the destruction of culture as, as, as part of genocide, um, and the exclusion of that kind of cultural uh, component from the Genocide Convention itself because Britain and the Soviet Union in particular did not want their own amb future ambitions in the case of the Soviet Union and past colonial practices in the case of uh, Great Britain coming back to be a source of international condemnation and perhaps international prosecution as well. So like just to be clear I think you know um, we, it's dangerous to rely on um, uh, documents like the Genocide Convention uh, when settling the question of whether or not there was genocide that occurred here. But your other question about you know, punishment, um, well actually your question was really about justice, not so much punishment. You know, we're gonna have to cash out in some rich way what we mean by, by justice. And the most optimistic I am is that if we're lucky, and the scholarship that I'm, I, I'm aware of that's emerging on this particular issue, um, most recently actually in a book on indigenous genocide co-edited by um, one of my colleagues here in sociology, um, Andrew Wolford, and Alex Hinton who runs the uh, Genocide Center at Rutgers University, um, just come out with Duke University Press on, on precisely this issue. Um, that this kind of scholarship and the kind of historical awareness that it will give rise to over time will minimally yield a kind of shame that if properly configured will count as a kind of or yield a kind of moral satisfaction that may have a component of justice to it. Whether or not that will yield kind of prosecutions and so forth. I mean, that's, that's only one form of justice, I think. And I would say great powers change. <coughs> and when great powers change, rules can change and who is prosecuted can change as well. So I don't think your comments are actually controversial. I think, I think you're bang on. Uh, we have a question right here. Oh, thank you. I would uh, <coughs> suggest that perhaps we've learned very little, if anything, from the wars around the world, the conflicts around the world, 
political uh, leaders um, seem to be content in spending trillions and trillions of dollars uh, to prevent war. They spend money on armaments and on navies and armies and airplanes and bullets and so on and so on. And yet it's not working because all you have to do is look around and see all kinds of conflicts. It seems to me, and maybe where the picture is, it doesn't make sense, that on one side of the picture there is all this money on defense, spent on defense and security, and almost nothing on probing the, uh, you know, the roots of conflicts, whether it's hatred, uh, whether it's social deprivation, whether it's natural justice, lack of freedom, lack of democracy, whatever. It, it seems that our political leaders just don't seem to get the picture. They just don't get it right. They seem to be more than just happy to spend money on defense. And it's, it's their visible way of, of saying to their people, to their electorates, we'll protect you, when perhaps they should be doing it in a very different way. So you're nodding in agreement. Yeah, no, I, mm -hmm. I think you're right, but it's easier to say, look, we have this plane and this ship, and it's very difficult to say, we have this plan for poverty reduction that involves this, that, and the other. It's, you know, often you have to be able to show something as well, and, and you know, the planes you can see. Well, oh, there it is. Um, it, it's, it's more difficult to see the solutions that might uh, work for these other these other issues, which is why you know social workers like Regine are so important. The other thing is the UN. They always say it has two souls. There's the soul to deal with international peace and security, and that's the UN Security Council, and it has power. The Economic and Social Council, General Assembly, etc. They don't have any power. They can't take any binding decisions. Um, in the ECOSOC chamber, the one thing they did do is they never finished the roof. And it was to symbolize the fact that the work of development is never finished. Um, and that's, you know, huh, politicians have very short attention spans. And if you tell them, you know, we will never be finished this development, we can always, you know, they kind of, huh, they've lost the plot. But if you tell them, look, we get this plane, we shoot this target, we're good, we're done, um, you know. I can understand that and mm -hmm. all right, sign that off. So You're I think that's part of the problem too. to a question from a former member of parliament. <laughs> <laughs> you and, are the exception. And of the course. former you lieutenant governor of Manitoba. Long and hard. <laughs> uh, we have another question from the back of the hall. Hi, uh, I was just wondering uh, where the colonization fits in here, particularly in Africa, where you have failed states like uh, Somalia, you know, uh, the genocide in Rwanda, Sudan, and Paul uh, Korea's book, The Bottom Billion, uh, most of them, they share uh, the fact that they are all from uh, failed states. But the question comes, why these states failed? And history is a big part of it, and particularly the colonization. So I was just wondering where that would fit. And I think Janine has another question from Conferences I.O. Last one. I, last one. Um, does the war in Iraq only exist to support the arms industry? <laughs> question, and it follows on from a number of others. Um, in, in fairness to the panel, I cheated a bit <coughs> and put up an article from Le Monde Diplomatique. Uh, Earlier this week, uh, it was by Andrew Basevich called um, Malarkey on the Potomac. And he starts the article with uh, a reference to a returned soldier from Iraq who says, Iraq does not exist. And it, this follows on from what your comments are, Andrea. Um, it, and my question was, does, does the war in Iraq, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, exist only to support the military industrial complex. It's been going on for so long, it's unlikely to, to change unless the public, as this gentleman explained, um, starts to question the economics of war. Adam, you have a response? So I, I just want to actually not, not address that because it's very technical. Uh, but I want to talk about colonialism briefly um, and just say this about it. I mean, I've been very swayed by Sven Lindquist's account of European colonial history um, and violence and exterminate, uh, exterminate all the brutes. 
his book um, that's sort of part travelogue, part um, philosophical meditation. And what he points out is that Europeans learn to kill large numbers of people and feel pretty good about it as colonialists. And we forget that the first genocide of the 20th century was not the Holocaust, it was not the Armenian genocide, it was the genocide of the Herero and Nama people in 1905-1906 in, in Southwest Africa, right? So um, I would say that the legacy of colonialism is actually uh, kind of crass in, and an on ongoing and enduring crass indifference uh, to lives not viewed as, uh, as worth living because they're not the same. Another question here, and then you get to ask the last question because you started. <laughs> So, question there, Denise? Oh, am I missing? Oh, sorry. Yeah, Andrew Basevich also wrote The New American Militarism and, you know, how the U.S. is fascinated by war and, you know, they, they, they do it a lot. <laughs> they do well. But I, I, don't, I don't know that article. Um, I, I don't think it's solely. I don't think these wars are solely for the military-industrial um, uh, complex, but I, I just don't, I don't know enough about it, and I think that's one of the areas we need desperately. We need cybersecurity experts, and we need forensic accountants to start tracking the money, because often these wars, the money is shifting hands you know, well before, and if we were tracking that a little bit more, um, I think we, we might be able to react before we get into a situation where, when we're doing war. If you're very brief, you can have a, another comment. The Constitution. And I think that this builds on what Regine was talking about as well, that we not, it's not just a matter of tackling the debate in the Potomac, but it's also creating the debate back in the country itself, Iraq, and how do you create a country with a new Constitution? And we have one question here. Yes? Sorry. Uh, my question was about the military industrial complex. Um, I don't know if you want to Google who manufactures weapons. And give me your opinion on uh, where the manufacturing of the weapons is taking place and where the usage is taking place. And then think about if war ceased to exist, all these people in the countries that manufacture the weapons that have invested trillions of dollars into their facilities. What's going to happen to their economy if their product is no longer needed? They can make plowshares. <laughs> uh, sorry, I wasn't being facetious. Did, do you have a reply? I think uh, at the end of the day, if we, look, we look back, uh, the economics of war is at the root of violence. Uh, it's who becomes powerful and accumulates as much as they can. Uh, it's uh, not only about the colonialism. I think all that has changed is the <coughs> vocabulary. But I think we are still faced with the same problems of exploitation and using violence to get to whatever you can put your hands on either locally or internationally. Mm -hmm. And a final question here. Hi, uh, thank you again. Um, so my question is about uh, how we can end this war. We seem to have created an empire where um, the P5 or you know, the big uh, alliances just try to you know, pick and choose their uh, enemies and pick and choose their conflicts. Um, and also that you know, since we have gone to Iraq without UN, against UN, UN regulation, you know, we have we've gotten into a lot of mess uh, to say the least. And we have been talking about all the failures tonight. Um, my question is, what should we change so that we can end this? Let me say maybe the least technical thing about in response to that, and then I'll leave it to other people. But I would say, I mean, what we need to change, and this partly gets back to Maria's question about the Falun Gong. I mean, how do we stop you know, genocide? You have to enter into the lives of others. You know, and you can do that in, in different ways. I think art has a crucial role to play in that. Narrative is crucial. Images by themselves don't work. But without the kind of empathy that arises from actually taking seriously other people who are different from you as human beings, I just don't think we can get anywhere, certainly not from the outside in, you know. Well, we went on because Iraq asked for help. 
So, and, and there are two reasons that we accept today for the use of force. One is collective and self-defense, and the other is if authorized by the UN Security Council. Yes, in the first case, you're usually supposed to revert back to the UN Security Council, but we did, we did go because the Iraq government asked us to. Um, Oh yeah, that was, that was different. Then, then we had a UN Security Council resolution. In 1990, the UN Security Council was very quick. They put in place sanctions and they said, this is your f final warning, you must pull out of Kuwait, otherwise we are applying force. And they waited a good three months after the deadline and then in the January they started, they, they sent it in. But that was authorized by the UN Security Council. My answer would be, Start wherever you are. I think uh, we all tend to take things for granted, including peace. Uh, and I think uh, we should invest as much, in, as much as possible in peace. Uh, maybe more than we actually try to look away when violence is happening around us. Uh, it, we don't need to wait until it's uh, in our backyard. I think we actually need to invest in it at any level we can, and to challenge the existing institutions. And one of the best anti-war tools that I've ever seen is Sesame Street. <laughs> they, when they have Sesame Street in countries where they've had war, and children are watching different groups being together and happy and learning to play and things like that, or soap operas is another thing they do where they get traditionally two groups that were at war in a soap opera and it's Romeo and Juliet, you know, they fall in love and things like that. But those tools can be <coughs> really powerful. Um, and it's about education and it's about, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's created by the people in that country. It's not us saying, here's your solution. Well, let's, uh, let's conclude it there. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. King, thank you. Dr. Sharon, Dr. Muller, thank you all. Hey, thanks for such great, incisive, penetrating questions. Uh, and uh, I'll mention as well that we encourage you to check out after the conversation page, as well as U of M today for a recap of the evening. And please join us again on Wednesday, January 21st for the next visionary conversation when we explore the topic, are you happy now? The pursuit of happiness in the modern age. It begins at 6.30, discussion at 7.00. Another lively and important discussion, and if you'd like me back, please appoint me as president of the university, and I'd be delighted to come back. Thank you again for inviting me here tonight. <laughs>